Nada. I'm lost now. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are so happy to have you all with us. Um, we would like to officially welcome you to our webinar entitled Beyond the Bedside, AAPI Nurses as Changemakers Championing Mental Health and Well-Being. This is a webinar celebrating Asian American Pac uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month and also recognizing Mental Health Awareness Month. The webinar is being co-organized by the Philippine Nurses Association of America, um, All In Wellbeing First for Healthcare, First Responders First, and the Asian American Pacific Islander Nursing Association. My name is Kasia Laskowski. I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second. And it is a pleasure to be with you all. I am the executive director of the Thrive Global Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of Ariana Huffington's behavior change technology company, Thrive Global. Thrive Global is one of the founding partners of First Responders First, which you see on the screen, is, which is one of the co-organizers of this webinar. And First Responders First is an initiative that was launched at the beginning of the pandemic to very simply care for our caregivers. It was launched jointly with Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health and the Creative Artists Agency with an ultimate goal to provide physical and psychological support to first responders and frontline healthcare workers who are responding to the pandemic. And from our work, you know, our, we first started just given the crisis at the time, at the beginning of the pandemic, we first started providing very basic, tangible um, provisions and protections. So free childcare for healthcare workers, accommodations, but also mental health support. And we really understood that mental health needs would be as great as the physical needs of our healthcare workers who continue to care for us, our loved ones and our communities during this time. Um, through our work with First Responders First, we launched All In Wellbeing First for Healthcare, which is a campaign and a call to action launched in partnership with the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation which is a foundation that was founded after, um, after the tragic suicide of Dr. Lorna Breen, who was a healthcare, um, an emergency director in um, New York during the time of the pandemic. And her family created this foundation to really advocate for mental health, um, mental health support and resources for healthcare workers nationwide. Um, we are thrilled to partner with the Dr. Learner Green Heroes Foundation and also our tier one collaborators who have joined us since the beginning of the launch of All In, including the American Hospital Association, the American Medical Association, the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare, Medicine Forward, many others, including PNAA, and we've been thrilled to have them as a partner. Um, I can just tell you that from my own experience of meeting with these wonderful women um, and accomplished you know, nurses, it has been a joy to host this webinar. And just given the recent events and the school shooting yesterday, there was a concern obviously of continuing to host something like this. But as all of you know, who are joining us, and I'm sure that many of you are healthcare professionals and nurses yourself, um, your work doesn't stop. Your work continues throughout the tragedies, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's um, a natural disaster, whether it is a tragedy like happened yesterday. So one of the goals of this webinar is to really provide you with some tools and some experiences from these accomplished women who have found a space to really take advantage of their own skill sets and advocate for mental health resources and supports and well-being while also offering incredible supports for mentorship along the way. So with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for this session, Dr. Mary Joy Garcia Diaz who is the president of the current president of the Philippine Nurses Association of America. Dr. Garcia Dia is the program director for the nursing informatics and the information technology department and the Center for Professional Nursing Practice at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She also serves on the Equity, D Diversity and Inclusion Steering Committee for the Future of Nursing Campaign for Action a joint initiative of the AARP and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. 
For the last eight years, she has been an advisor to the PNAA Human Rights Committee on matters involving unfair labor practice. And she also, as you can, as you will tell from her work and from her own experience, she is extremely passionate about the education of healthcare professionals. In reading some of her bios and some of the uh, some of the words written about her, but also her message to nurses on this nurse helping this nursing month, um, Dr. Garcia Dia mentioned that she is passionate about communication from the top down and bottom up. And in my short time of knowing her, I found exactly that. Um, she is constantly and continuously elevating the voices of those who are around her and also advocating for well-being, ensuring that all of her colleagues and everyone who has come into contact with her leaves a better person. So I will pass it over to you, Dr. Garcia Dia. Thank you so much, Kasia. And we are so thrilled to partner with All In Wellbeing First for Healthcare, First Responder First, and also our AAPINA colleagues. Good afternoon from New York. We are thrilled to have with us today four distinguished AAPI nurse leaders who have championed mental health and well being within their own professional capacity, as well as volunteers of their own nursing organization. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to take this opportunity to express our sympathies to the families who lost their loved ones as a result of hate crime and gun violence. Our hearts go out to the community in Buffalo, New York, and recently Uvalde, Texas. Our hope that we can heal together as a nation and continue to advocate towards legislative and healthcare policy that will protect our community and address behavioral health and mental well being. So, this is really a timely webinar for all of us. And I know that this is a webinar session. We see our audience. I think we have over 42 participants, and this is live streamed via Facebook. So we hope that we'll be able to reach your homes wherever you are. And even though you can only see all of us as panelists, we hope that you will interact with us by typing in your chat questions or reactions. We will be moderating these conversations, and I'm glad to introduce our four panelists. So let me begin with our first panelist, Dr. Risa Mauricio, who is a pediatric critical care medicine advanced practice nurse from Children's Cancer Hospital in Texas. She is an APN intensivist in pediatric critical care and assistant professor at the University of Texas Health and Science Center. She is also the former director of advanced practice providers an assistant professor at University of Texas McGovern Medical School. She has a lot of accolades after her name, but what makes her special is her engagement in our professional organization and also being past board of director for AACN. She has co-lead the development of the 2020 ICU Choosing Wisely evidence-based recommendations for appropriate and necessary care. Our next panelist is Dr. Kathy Abram Yago. She is the Professor Emerita of Nursing from San Jose State University, the Valley Foundation School of Nursing. Her nursing experience has been in a variety of settings, which include medical surgical care, coronary care, intensive care, and home care. She has taught undergraduate and graduate students. She has a mix of 80 invited and refereed work in the area of mentoring, student achievement, and leadership development. Our third panelist is Dr. Mijun Park. Dr. Park is a tenured associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco. She is a national expert on health equity and Asian American mental health issues. Her research effort focuses on healthy aging and well being across the lifespan. She is one of the early researchers who discovered the link that living in poor neighborhood is associated with faster cellular aging. As a doctorally prepared psychiatric nurse, Dr. Park has extensive experience 
in marginalized populations working in both the United States and Korea. She is a longtime member of the Asian American Pacific Nurses Association and contributor to their association's journal. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Rose Eva Constantino. She is a faculty member of the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing and a practicing lawyer in family law with a PhD in psychiatry and mental health nursing. Her experience taught her how to calm, which is C-A-L-M, meaning collaborate, anticipate, listen, and manage. Really in times of stress, new or unprecedented situations. <clears throat> Calming down greatly contributes to her personal and professional trajectory. Through leadership experience as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Jordan and a visiting scholar at Cebu Normal University in Cebu, Philippines, and Central Escolar in Manila, she made a paradigm shift to frugal disruptive innovation with the same guiding values of autonomy, respect, justice, fairness, veracity, truthfulness, and empathy. Thank you so much for joining us today in this very important and meaningful discussion. So let me start with you sharing who you are, your experiences, and what led you for your advocacy towards mental health and well-being, especially for our AAA, AAPI community. Dr. Arisa Marzuisha, do you want to start? Sure, I can start the ball rolling. Um, so actually, my, my love for mental health and um, wellness started when I became a nurse practitioner and taking care of chronically ill children because they are in intensive care and vulnerable to trauma. I always wonder how they are coping being either you're a patient or the family. And um, because you're in a traumatic environment, and especially when I was in cancer uh, management, I always thought also of how our families coping when their loved ones die. And so moving forward, now when we have the pandemic, I was tasked, and thank you to our PNAA president, Dr. Garcia Dia, I was charged on how we can help support our members in terms of their emotional um, wellness. And we were faced with a lot of challenges during the pandemic. So what PNAA did was um, very, I think, very visionary by thinking forward of what's going to happen, not only at the time when the pandemic was due, when there were no PPEs or um, the guidelines at the bedside on what to do and what nurses had to do with the pandemic was really inconsistent. And a lot of us were very anxious and afraid of what this virus would be. We have forethought, what are we going to do with our nurses? It seems like we almost know from the very beginning that this pandemic will not end like magic. We know that it would drag on. And what is going to happen to our nurses when this will continue for a long time? And it did truly happen that way. Um, so the first year of the pandemic, while there were surges on and off, we um, wanted to do a survey and we surveyed all our nurses on their emotions of how they are feeling even behind the mask. And at the, along that same time as well, the American Nurses Association did a survey of all the nurses in the nation. It was so telling the stark difference in terms of results between those two surveys. And, um, and I hope I will be able to share those um, um, results even briefly during this conversation. And so after that, after that, when we did the survey, um, we gathered a committee and how we can move forward to support our nurses. And definitely what is important to us, and Dr. Garcia Dia and Dr. Iago can attest to this, that resilience is very important. But when as a nurse at the bedside, you are constantly bombarded with trauma, particularly those that are in acute care, um, emergency medicine, and what's going to happen to you would only not be stressful for yourself as well as 
secondary stress from just experience in taking care of patients who are traumatized either because of constantly ill or um, from this pandemic or through death in isolation. Um, so we thought of perhaps doing a program anchoring on the foundation that resilience is very important. Mm -hmm. So we had several self-care webinars and embark on resilience training that Dr. Yao can expound further. And then we, and then finally did also as well, aside from that, did a support group amongst our members, knowing that what is important from the survey that we found is having a program that is culturally driven so that each one of us can support one another. And perhaps from then on, um, Dr. Yaga, you wanna expound on the resilience program that we did? Yes, thank you. The resilience program was developed by Dr. Seuss and I was uh, involved in the training for over six months. And after that, we had three webinars for our members and it included also module development. During that time, we also looked at strategies on how to build resilience. Some examples of building resilience were looking at developing grateful attitude. Every morning, instead of be lying in bed and saying, oh my goodness, I have to meet with the nurse manager, I have to do this for a patient, I have to do this for, um, a doctor, you begin to think about what you're grateful for. So instead of having all these things and cluttering your head and stressing yourself out, even before you get out of bed, you think about, oh, I'm so grateful for my husband. We've been married now for 40 years. I'm so grateful for my vision because I've had so many eye surgeries that I can see this blue, blue sky. And even though I have a daughter with special needs, I'm so grateful because she helps me every day and it helps me be settled and to be present for everyone. So having those strategies have been helpful. The other issue in looking at gratefulness is also looking at joy. What is our joy every day? Now for me, I'm a new Lola. As you many of you know, it's a grandmother. And I look at that little girl who's only four and a half months and it makes me smile. And there's something about that feeling. It just makes you happy. And that's important. For me, working as a faculty member during the COVID time, my concern was also with the area of students. I had a three hour leadership class. And during that time, I felt that before we talked about the content to check in, how are you doing? What are you gonna do today? And those things are important as the next generation of nurses to begin to think about what are ways to cope. And talking about it is very helpful. And then at the end of the class, circling around and say, how are you doing? What are you gonna do this weekend? Now remember, breathe, let's exercise. And don't forget the most important thing is sleep. Sleep regenerates cells that you need to work. And I think that's really important when we're talking about the issue of mental health, that the new nurses that are coming out need to schedule that time exercise, that time to find joy, that time to be with individuals and people who love them. Because nursing is hard. And to be able to discuss that, that has been important for me. And I know that sometimes after class, I have to debrief myself because sometimes I cry after. I cry because I feel that these nurses feel they're not, there's no hope. How, how are they going to continue? But to tell them not to worry, we are not closing down the school because there were some nursing schools that closed for a year. And so to be able to tell them, trust the process, let's keep going and move forward. And like I said, that was hard for me at the end because I, I cried and I called up my colleagues and had my own Zoom meeting and I had all my debriefing session because of all this, but then that's okay. 
because I needed to do that at that time. And I also want to comment with Dr. Seuss program. There's so many things that you can learn. And also just want to let you know, if you Google Dr. Seuss, he has a resilience program, and also, also with Dr. Seuss, he has a resilience assessment test that you could take to see where you are on resilience scale. So why not? It's free. Do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I like the resilience and finding joy each time you wake up uh, in the morning. And I think that's really what's fueling us mm -hmm. to continue as um, nurses going back to the bedside, giving up our uh, own time and really focusing on our patient. But we need to replenish that joy each day. Yeah. And Dr. Mi Jung Park, I know that you have done a lot of work in this as well. Would you like to share your body of work? Sure. Uh, I know I have uh, three minutes. So anybody who is interested in your more than welcome to come to a UCSF website on my profile. But I would like to actually limit uh, my talk about uh, Asian American mental health and then, and then uh, stress management. So I moved to San Francisco in the U.S. Uh, when I was close to 30 to study for a doctoral study. Um, and during that time, I also worked at San Francisco General Hospital in psychiatric unit. As an immigrant myself, I uh, keenly aware of the difficulties of navigating the mental health care systems or health care systems. And I find that it's very interesting. I didn't understand why I cannot include families oftentimes to the care planning and care execution when the patient is in a psychiatric unit. I find that the concept of mental illness and um, well-being is different from what I was conceptualized uh, before when I was come to the U.S. So I see the uh, very complex intersection between uh, culture and health and healthcare delivery, and that's what motivates me actually to work on many different aspects of Asian American mental health issues. As a current role, I'm a more of educator and researcher, so I do two things. I, I think it is very important that we train our nursing students to help them to identify uh, strategies for stress and coping before they enter into the workforce. So I really appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, Abrim uh, Iago's uh, ideas about uh, resiliency. In my class, uh, students oftentimes to do the guided uh, meditation uh, so that if that works for them, not everybody, I find that not everybody is actually like uh, guided meditation. So while they're in the school, they, they're encouraged to identify what works for them and what does not before they actually enter into the caring professions, in my view, so that they can become an effective healthcare provider. And then we also use poetry and music and then if any other recreational or art form of health uh, management of their stress also. The second component is that while we are encouraging many of our, our underserved uh, individuals enter into school in nursing so that they can go back to their own community, I want to specifically design a support for them so that we are ensure that they can become a, uh, receive sufficient mentorship and then they can help themselves as well as their patients to navigate complex healthcare uh, landscape as well. Finally, um, during the COVID, in addition to supporting our health uh, um, nursing students, I also did a research on the uh, nurses who work in the COVID um, unit in San Francisco uh, UCSF Medical Center. And I witnessed the kind of contribution that nurses do to, to during this pandemic. However, I also witnessed the emotional, physical, and psychological toll that pandemic actually put on in our nurses. So this uh, webinar is, has been extremely uh, 
uh, timely to some degree. And what I learned during that time is that institutional support for nurses have been lacking. Mm -hmm. And while we ask nurses to work more, we fail to support them profoundly to some degree. So we would like to make sure that I want to make sure that we have enough uh, sufficient support in the future so, so that nurses can get support and um, support for their mental health and stress management as well. Thank you so much for that insightful um, uh, work that you have done. And you mentioned institutional support is really important. And I would like to um, go back to Dr. Rose Constantino because I know she has also done a lot of work with resilience. So Dr. Rose Constantino, would you like to expand on that um, body of work that you have done from your end? Oh, okay, thank you very much. But I am really honored to be here with you and to be in this panel and to be with this glorious panel that is assembled here and for the participants, I would like them uh, their presence is very important today because we really are living in a tattered time. Uh, I say tattered because there's like war, rumors of war. Um, gasoline price is very high. Grocery prices are very high. Um, and then there's shootings. Um, other kinds of things that are going on. And so people are really, my friends in Pittsburgh, especially, um, we're looking at a, a dim future. It's like a dim future, but we should be um, gratified that we have these people who are really working hard, like, you know, nurses, physicians and everybody else, you know, working for uh, the good of the community. Um, you mentioned about my work with resilience. Uh, it's hard because I had to go back to uh, conceptualizing, contextualizing, and uh, develop a, a, a paradigm that would change um, resilience into well-being. Uh, it does it really go into well-being. So um, we had to do that in a research proposal. Uh, we called it heart. It's heart. It's health, experience of abuse, Resilience, technology use, your use of computer. It sometimes is very good for most people that it gives them um, a relationship, connections to many people. So it's um, technology use and social support. We paired resilience and social support with resilience as the inner, inner strength that you have to grow, uh, to recover from something or to cope with stressors. And so you get your resilience. You thought maybe you got that in your uh, biochemical uh, ingredients in your bodily, your bodily, um, your bodily, uh, your resilience inside uh, that makes you do that. Um, or you learn that from your family. You know, the family is also a giver of uh, support. And so uh, you also look at that as some a resource that you can also use. So, so it's resilience and social support together that one is really, uh, in, in, inspires the other or, uh, and, and the other one also like make the other one more, more um, apparent. 
uh, in, in intervention. So those are the things that we are doing. And we did the heart study in Pittsburgh, in Cebu, and in Manila. Um, so we have like research the people there we have published and we presented it to um, international uh, looking at how resilience and social support can be um, can result to become an intervention that is usable for anybody. It doesn't have to be um, it doesn't have to be someone experiencing abuse, but it can be with anyone who just wants to go with resilience. Resilience is like fungible. It's fungible. It's like a fund. It's money that goes away sometimes when you have too much stress. That's what fungible is. It, it goes away and it has to be replenished. And those are the nurses. And those are the nurses, doctors who are doing this, Mijong is doing all those uh, intervention, um, uh, Catherine, Dr. Ariza, Dr. Riza, and also um, this people who are really looking at resilience and see what does it really work. And it really works. It really works. It gives them, uh, view in life uh, that more that's more um, bountiful, more uh, accommodating, um, and it, it also gives them hope. And I think hope is really the most important thing that we could give also to people who are um, in 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 unprecedented times during this uh, pandemic. Um, uh, abuse, abuse was really already bad before the pandemic. Abuse is not being helped through intervention or, you know, the, the lawyers were really doesn't know what, what, what to do. All they have to do is go to court and then that's it. Give them a paper and say, this is it, you know, you're now clear. But it doesn't protect them. You know, the bullet, the knife, the, the slap and the face, it doesn't, it doesn't give them any hope. So, um, so I thought that the resilience will give them the hope of really going back, looking for uh, social support, looking for ways that they can really seek help. It takes, it takes very, um, uh, competent, it, it take competence to seek help. You cannot just say, you know, I want this, I want this, or I want to do that. No, in seeking help, we have to let them know that their voice are important. That somebody has to listen. Somebody has to listen to what they do, uh, what they're saying, and really understand what their needs are, and let them do the um, let them do the de de decision to give them the autonomy to make the decision. You cannot tell them um, you have to leave. You have to leave now. You are, because leaving a, an abuser is the most there is a very bad decision to do. Um, so they have to make it themselves, and they have to do again the help seeking and also the planning for the um, thing. And I think uh, resilience does that a lot. Right. And Thank I you. totally agree with you, Dr. Rose, uh, in terms of resilience being both a process and an outcome, right? And I think this is yes, where exactly. we, would, we would like to segue in terms of one of the questions that our uh, audience have posted is that uh, in terms of recognizing and managing burnout, and how do we manage it effectively? Because we have seen that um, not, not only during the pandemic, but even yeah. the pandemic, 
we have seen a lot of burnout in our nurses, particularly for critical care areas, emergency nursing department, and it has been compounded as a result of the pandemic. But these mm -hmm. emotions of um, giving up on the nursing profession, of being tired because we, we can't move forward, this has been in existence. And this is where this timely question is really out there. How do we recognize and manage burnout? And looking at it from a cultural perspective, especially for Asian American communities, um, we are so used to bearing it out, right? And then just moving forward and then keeping silent. How do we support them to overcome that burnout? I, we developed four students, myself and another faculty, developed, uh, you, you review the literature for burnout. Um, and we looked at uh, the gas going on empty, going on empty. Our brains are now empty really because we're not only looking at our patients, the assignments but sometimes it's, there's more people that you have to work through during the day, during the shift. And then, or their days now are longer, some of them. Um, so uh, it really has to look at what, what they're feeling first. Sometimes nurses, physicians, social workers can't really look at their own needs. We really think that we're going there. You know, we have to finish this. Um, after the shift, we go home and then there's more to be done. So it doesn't really work. So that somebody, somebody, and I just heard it today. I had a signal. I have a webinar today, and he said the employer should be with these nurses, people who are working in the hospitals. The employer should be the safe guard. You know, so it should be a place where uh, they're taught. They're taught. We train them how to look at somebody who's really going on empty. I think, I think we ourselves cannot right away diagnose ourselves that we're going on empty because you will just say, um, uh, I've been taught this way, I work this way, I don't go to sleep at night uh, until like 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. No, I think they have to, this, this, this employer would have to be trained to see which is uh, what employee without any judgment, okay? Without any judgment, without any any um, thing that you know you, you need help, you know. You, but it has to be a plain uh, with, with uh, constant just a, a, a attributing to them that the employer should know, you know, which you know which. Uh, Employee, employee should go, go to rest, go for a vacation, go something, and you know so that. And I, I, I agree, and I think this aligns with Dr. Park's um, initial suggestion of having that institutional support, right? Yeah. So, in your own organization, um, Dr. Park, um, what have you done from Aapina in addressing burnout, um, especially for? Faculty, you have a lot of burnout as well <laughs> through the years. I know how challenging it is. And um, being an adjunct faculty, I appreciate all the faculty professors that are really out there to mentor our nursing students. In, indeed. In, in fact, um, when it comes to burnout, I can ask, uh, I can answer two different uh, um I can give you two different answers. First one is that actually burnout, the best treatment for burnout is actually prevention. So the, the effort and institutional effort should actually prioritize preventing the burnout rather than uh, remediate them. So one of the reasons why I think it's very important for, for me at least, that in the schools, when students are in the school, they should be able to provide it support for them to be able to manage the stress 
and uh, stress properly so that they don't get burned out once they enter the caring profession at work, in my view. Um, once the employees are already burned out, it's very difficult to, um, how should I say, uh, remedy that because they're already in a very deep, um, deep, uh, prolonged, uh, uh, to some degree, not only the stress, but demoralization where they felt that they can't do it anymore. And then they felt they don't see a lot of choices other than stay at work and demoralize or they just quit. So many of educational system faculties are also very tired and we, we are losing a lot of uh, resignation mm -hmm. as well as uh, um, retirement at this point. It's not only, uh, it's not an, I'm not talking about UCSF actually, I'm talking about overall higher education. There is a, many of uh, teachers actually are leaving the profession because it's very, very difficult. The, the question, therefore, is that how can we help one another to manage the stress when it's, the impact is small rather than uh, it snowballs until it gets burned out? Um, of note, a personal note, I think burnout uh, nurses usually are not a good nurses. They are, they are not effective caring provider. Because of that, I think it is important for us to, it is a mandate, professional mandate for all healthcare providers to take care of themselves because it is our duty to be able to help others. And then we cannot help others when we are not happy, when we are burned out, or when we are not able to uh, care our own. And I think it is it should be important message to students as well as the faculties, as well as nurses. Absolutely. And I know that um, Dr. Mauricio, you have probably encountered a lot of surges, right? In, in the past uh, two years, uh, we have the ups and downs. Uh, we have the Omicron. We thought we're safe. And, and now we're also starting to see an increased positivity all of this and the ongoing social unrest that's been um, uh, happening in our country adds up to our uh, capacity when we receive our patients on the practice side. And I know that there is a question here from Connie de Guzman in terms of a gratitude board where people could have a, a huddle area to recognize our staff and collect thank you cards and, and maybe you know recognizing employees through this uh, recognition board. So what have you seen in your practice? Uh, do you think this is working? And in terms of like promoting teamwork, being kind, helping each other and inspiring staff, what can you share from your end, uh, Risa? So um, I, I agree with you. So at some point, I just wanna, um, two things I wanna, um, touch base on one is cultural and the other thing whether it's culture in the unit or culture is you um, based on your ethnicity right so when we talk about um, gratitude board and what have you sending emails or giving you pizza all the time like to a point I wonder like how much pizza can you give me or candies right because that's what you normally um, receive from the leaders um, Dr. Yago is laughing but that's actually what's happening now in the units like how much more pizza can you get? Well, on the other hand, you're promoting, you know, weight production or wellness. Um, so I would say in terms of recognition, I would make it a point that it has to be meaningful. And because when it's not meaningful, like um, the, the people can also can always look at it only in a superficial level, right? And when I say meaningful, I would say if you're thanking somebody, attach something to it that there's a reason why you're thanking that person. You cannot just say, thank you, for instance, but if somebody gives you a chair, you would say, thank you for offering to me to this old lady, because I'm actually, you know, tired already of standing. So I think that's the meaningful recognition, I say, as opposed to just say, here's the pizza, or, you know, here's the candy, can you, do you want to get one? The second thought that I have is that's a unit culture, right? The other thing that I want to point out is having invested or entrenched on you internally in terms of your cultural background, because those are external things that, you know, Dr. Constantino, Dr. Park, Dr. Yago, you all mentioned about. 
but what about internal um, reward that you can have and, and, and develop amongst yourself? Can you tap into your cultural values? For instance, among Filipinos, we know that there's what we call Bayanihan. So I, I know there are um, several Filipinos that are here in this webinar. And if you recall, as um, Kathy and MJ in the Philippines, when you talk about Bayanihan, way back then, when people are moving their small nipahats from one community, or you call barangays to one another, it's like the whole barangay would come and help you, right? So if you translate that kind of value to what we are feeling right now, to develop that inner resilience, what about if we use that value of Bayanihan? that all of us, whether Filipino, Asian, what have you, that we all are suffering with this. And why can we not work together as a Bayanihan team and support one another? And this is anchored on the fact, on the survey that we did, um, MJ and Kathy, right? People are saying in that survey, when we did a survey amongst our Filipino nurses on how they are feeling during the pandemic, you know what they said? in terms of coping. The first one, of course, is spirituality, but the second one is really calling friends, calling my family. So that's social interaction and social networking is very important. And I, um, I compare that to the American Nurses Association survey. And what came up of that as the first one in terms of coping is entertainment, entertaining themselves. So there's really that big difference. So you see the connection, the social connection to us as an individual is very important and much more for us Filipino, and I can talk um, only among Filipinos, through our Bayanihan spirit and the Pakikisama value that we always have. Remember, I don't know if you recall, um, when I'm in the unit, I bring for lunch, I bring a lot of food because I know that it is very important for us to share. It's our Pakikisama value of sharing what we have, sharing the goodness. But what about also sharing um, how we can together form something, either an alliance to strengthen our inner self? Because I think that's an important thing that we can do, whether we can do it collectively together um, with AAPNA or PNAA and the whole world. Absolutely. And, and it really is a collaboration, right? And I want to pin in on Dr. Yago because when I met her, um, she always tells her story about advocacy, right? And, and, and how her dad had taught her to be proud of who we are. And Kathy, would you like to share that story in terms of um, recognizing our own cultural identity? Yes. Uh... I was a very, I was an active nurse in the CCU and ICU, any kind of patients I will take. And there was one evening that a nurse colleague came to me, please, please help me. I need to tie down my patient. My patient is confused. I need to tie down. Now, back in the day, we could do that, right? But we can't do that now. And I remember telling the nurse, would you please, um, I'll be there. Just give me some time. Let me finish my assessment. Let me finish giving my patients meds and I'll be right there. And I remember coming in the doorway and this man, because I learned Ilocano, because even though I'm first generation, that was really important for my parents as an American born child to know a little bit about the language. And so as I stood there, this man said in Ilocano, nurse, nurse, I'm in pain. Help me, help me. And then I, my colleague comes with all her, uh, the equipment, and I said, you know what? When was the last time did you give this patient medication? Well, uh, let's see, about 30 minutes ago. Well, you know what? You need to call the doctor because this patient is in so much pain and to tie him up is not the right thing to do. And I remember that at that moment, that was an, a, a pivotal moment for me as a nurse. And I thought, no way is this gonna happen to any Filipino, any Latino, any African-American, because I'm gonna be a teacher now. I'm gonna go and teach future nurses how to look at in-depth assessment, 
She didn't, the blood pressure was up, the pulse was up, breathing was up, you know, posturing, grimaces. And this was an experienced CCU nurse. And I thought, this is not going to happen. What would happen if this man goes home? And he says to his friends, oh, I went to the hospital. I was in pain and the nurse tied me up. Do you think they're going to come back to healthcare? No, they're not. They won't do that. And a part of this pivotal moment is what my father and my parents told, taught me, is that it's important as an educated individual that you need to help others. You need to give the best care. You need to do this. And yes, you will be judged by this, but don't let that be something that's a barrier. And you have a commitment to do that. And for me to continue to do this, and as a teacher, this is my legacy to them. This is my legacy to my parents who came to this country and gave us the opportunity to do well and to also provide for our community. And that's why I, I, I've taught for 35 years at San Jose State School of Nursing, because that was my mission, that was my purpose, and that's the legacy of my parents. Thank you for sharing, Kathy. And I know um, it's almost 6.52. And um, I know we slated this for, I believe, an hour. But I want to make sure that we hone in on how do we, as a community, identify the persistent mental health and well-being challenges that we all face as healthcare professionals, right? Look at ourselves to our own self-reflection. What advice would you give us in terms of doing our own self-care and taking, of our, taking care of ourselves? I would like to make a comment in that we need to change this up a little bit. We need to look at the leadership and who are making the decisions in the hospital. And we need to acknowledge that nurses, travel nurses who have come in and are making 10 times what a nurse who's been there for 10 years what does that say to them? And we need to look at that recognition. As Risa said, what's the value? What's going on? And I think we need to change it up. And we need to look at and sit down and say, we know hospital is a business. It's a business. But what are we doing to the nurses who gives the care, compassionate and empathy care? What are we doing to support them? And I know that as Asian nurses, Filipino nurses, the issue is self-care. We want to do more, but sometimes we have to tell our nurse manager, I'm sorry, I can't come in. I'm not feeling good. Self-care. Self-care is critical. I want to actually echo um, uh, Dr. Graham Siago's uh, notion about how institution hospitals actually taking care of their most critical workforce. Nurses actually are the largest workforce in any given hospital, and their support waxed and waned during the COVID. And in early times, they had a really strong support. I, I would not actually discount it as a uh, lip services. I think they genuinely supported nurses. But while we are having this, you know, um, COVID being getting better, Actually, nurses are actually at the back of their interest at this point, and I'm very unsatisfied with that. And support for nurses have to be there. It's not only for one time when we need them, and then when we feel we don't need nurses anymore, we withdraw the support, and that's not okay. And this has to be to be heard in a loud and clearly. And then sometimes I, I feel like, you know, it's like a, a fire person, right? When a firefighter, when there is a fire, there are the best people in the world. But after the fire is gone and nobody really, will, uh, we, we appreciate them, but they get less attention and support because there is no emergency. And nurses' support has been like that throughout the history. When we are called upon, nurses always have showed up and we always sacrificed, but our sacrifice has not been fully recognized that I have to say. Yeah, 
I, I think we have to add also that uh, it's very important to, I, I use the word calm down, um, both literally and figuratively calm down. I learned that from my instructor uh, in, in, in uh, my instructor in nursing in, in procedures procedures she he would uh, she would let me miter my bed do my all go to the patient's bath but she is very calm when i am not doing the right thing she is calm so i to look at that at um uh, at figuratively she really is um looking at consultation it has to be it has to be collaboration all the time. I think we all have to collaborate this time in this during this time uh, that we are uh, looking at some of the what's going on around us. So collaborate, even if we are way out there because we have all the we have all the we have the zoom we have all the zoom that we could connect ourselves. So. We collaborate even in the search, even in teaching, and also in identifying interventions such as such as um, um, the intervention that is being mentioned today um, in different ways. So calm down. Uh, we have to listen um, uh, and then manage. Yeah, manage. It's it's uh, and, yeah, and I also want to add. Um, I agree with Dr. Park in what she mentioned. I think it's really time for us for action, right? And action from the top. And um, when we say action, anchor on healthy work environment and having an authentic leader that would truly and meaningfully care for all of us, healthcare providers, including nurses, because we have to remember the landscape of nursing will be and will change now in the next few months because of the graduates that we're having are graduates of the pandemic. And we, they have experienced trauma, whether it's secondary or primary, just being in the pandemic and the stressors that they have encountered at the bedside. And so what would that look like in terms of these nurses when the baby boomers will be exiting in another five to 10 years? And the baby boomers are the senior nurses that we have that are actually in critical care areas that are taking care of the sickest of all sickest patients in our nation. Um, so we have to really think of what we can do and it has to be from top down action. Number two, we need as faculty, because I think most of us here are in faculty position, that we also need to think of the students that are coming in. And I think we all know about what we call trauma-informed nursing education. And that just means that us as faculty has to be sensitive on the support that we are going to give to our students and how they are performing at the bedside and how they are performing um, clinically or at lecture, because in that way, you are supporting them from the very start and you're developing a culture of recognizing that you have you know, anxiety or emotional issues that you're able to take care of one another together as you move forward. So to me, action really needs to happen now, whether that's coming from us as nurses or our environment, you just mentioned Cassia, you just mentioned from the beginning, and Dr. Garcia Dia just mentioned from the beginning, look at our environment, the shooting that we are experiencing, you know, in our surroundings. If we are not going to do something, when? Thank you so much for that insightful and really um, meaningful conversation that everyone have shared. I know that we need to come together not only from a practice perspective, but also policy and legislation perspective. And this is where we as an organization have that unified voice to move the needle. So we can really focus on what's important in protecting not just the public, 
but the nurses that take care of the health of the community. So thank you so much for this rich conversation. And I will turn it over to Kasia, who will provide resources and also a um, evaluation link for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia Dia, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, your insight, your wisdom, your experience is just invaluable for all of the participants here. And I agree with one of the comments that an hour is definitely not enough to cover this topic. So perhaps we can think of a follow-up session because I know that there's a lot more that can be discussed um, and a lot more experience you can also share. Obviously the need is urgent and critical and um, you know there is no public health without the health worker and there is no health worker without the nurse. There have been so many um, important discussion topics in this conversation. And if you think back to kind of the introduction of how I shared first responders first came to be, um, when we think about the support and culturally tailored resources that are needed to really help prioritize healthcare worker and nurse well being. It is about those resources, but it's also about the systems level change that needs to happen to create safe environments, to create meaningful um, appreciation for our nurses and our healthcare workforce. And that's really what we're trying to do at All in Wellbeing First for Healthcare. We are trying to really tackle the systems change piece to create environments and healthcare workplaces where healthcare workers and nurses can really thrive and take advantage of resources without the fear of stigma without the fear of retribution, seeing mental health as a sign of strength, not of weakness. So I'm going to share quickly my screen so you can um, see some of the resources that we um, have available, but you will all also be receiving this in a follow-up email. So don't hesitate you know, to reach out to us once you do re um, receive that email if you have any questions, but here are some mental health resources. First Responders First also has a free nursing resilience course that has um, eligibility for CEUs. And of course, we always include the National Suicide Prevention Hotline because as you heard on this important webinar, peer support and just the community and um, even family members, that is the kind of support that is needed to create change and to help people move from awareness to action, awareness that they're burnt out, awareness that they need mental health help to actually taking um, advantage of those resources and supports. So these resources will all be shared with you via email. And we will also send out this link to complete a survey about this webinar. Um, we hope that you'll share feedback, constructive feedback as well, so we can continue to tailor these webinars and sessions to meet your needs. If there was something that you wanted to ask but didn't have the chance to do that, you can also share it in this survey. Um, but we would just like, again, to thank all of you for joining us. Um, and this nurses month, you know, May, we're just coming to a close, but every month needs to be nurses month. And this is a beautiful moment to also celebrate AAPI heritage month. And I can't think of a better way to have all of you esteemed panelists and our tremendous moderator. So thank you all for everything that you did to make this such a such a wonderful session. I would like to acknowledge behind the scene all our um, technical support team yes. from Melissa Long, Carol Robles, and also the support of our AAPI leaders who are part of this panel, Dr. Jing Wang and our president-elect, Dr. Gloria Berionis. And the rest of the crowd, you were really, really so engaging in your comments uh, from Chris Iscarilla from San Diego to Jenny Bissell from Hawaii and Kristin Fabico in Metro DC. Thank you for all your participation. And if I forget to mention someone, please bear with me, I'm getting old as well. <laughs> but we appreciate your presence this evening and sharing this afternoon with us. Mahalo. Aloha. Mahalo. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Bye.